Yes. Um, yeah, works for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Um, let's get started. So it's um, we'll talk about documentation today, uh, or in this lesson, like uh, Richard mentioned, and um, let's start with a really broad question: <laughs> Why do you need documentation? Like, what's the mm -hmm. point? Um, so, any takers? Uh, yeah. Why do you need good documentation? Um, so, one of the um, probably the most important reason to write good documentation, at least like when you're working on your own project, when you're starting starting out. Um, it might seem that you know how everything works in your code when you're writing it, and you probably do. But then like a month later, or even a week later, or sometimes even a day later, you come back to it, and it is very much not clear what is uh, what is doing what. Mm. So that is, like we said about version control, like one of the main reasons you need version control is for yourself. Um, the same goes for documentation. One of the main reasons is for yourself. Um, and probably also like a good rule of thumb of when your documentation is good is when you think you could actually read it and figure out what's going on. So that is, that's a big reason. Um, and of course, another, another good reason, another big reason is, um, that it helps other people use your project and therefore it, it helps other people then get. Uh, make contributions and makes your project more useful. Okay. Um, Shall we go into this set lesson part? Or... Yes, I think um, Where... the icebreakers covered essentially, um, okay. like the the introduction. So let's go to motivation and wish list. Yeah. Um, sure. I mean already started talking a bit about documentation uh, about um motivation mm. um why is it important so should we start so there is now a documentation section at the bottom of the notes mm. um so uh should we start a a quick question here i'll write down the question um and then a, a lot of the lesson will be this kind of discussions in the notes. So I will write why documenting code or why you should you document your code. And uh, and just, yeah, please um, write some answers. So write down why you think documentation is useful. And um, also, what do you think is what do you need for good documentation? So what do you think would be useful for yourself um, if you are uh, working in your own code? And what would you actually want from someone else's code, someone else's project in their documentation? Hmm. And um, assuming you are working with a research group um, who's using the code, how do you motivate your colleagues to contribute to the documentation? That's also an important question. So let's mm -hmm. um, let's wait a few minutes before we go into the some um, answers we have already given, but these are now in these are now by no means correct answers. Mm -hmm. um, your answers will be more correct. So please go ahead and write down in the notes. Indeed, we'll wait, we'll wait a uh, minute or so to see what answers come up. Yes. Mm -hmm.
killed mm a lot of good answers yeah mm, yeah mm. so what do we have to make it possible for others um other people to use the code that is important um that includes of course your colleagues you so one option is um if you have a a normal average sized research group what would that be five people using your code mm -hmm. to some extent um one option is to write down the answers to the most obvious questions in the beginning the other option is to tell everybody one by one uh, probably a couple of times um so uh yeah that is a big reason to write documentation but then also mm -hmm. and of course not just your colleagues but if you publish it then um other people might also benefit and and that is of course good um mm -hmm. to know what is doing what is needed what are the outputs needs to be sufficiently clear so that i'm able to tweak it yeah so um that's true yeah Sometimes yeah so I'll this is it. like um i see a function it, it's a uh, like several lines of code uh yeah. 20 lines of code um it's nice if it has good documentation so that i don't actually have to like try to read the code to figure out what it's doing um, yeah mm -hmm. um yeah so that it's usable what's the point if it's not yeah if, yeah if, if you're not only writing for yourself um, I hear a bit of an echo again. Did something change at the microphones? I think so. Oh well. Um, yeah. Yeah. So as a, if you're only writing for yourself, um, well, even then you should document because you will forget. But that is, it is. Um, you're kind of, in a way, wasting effort because someone else could also be using um, the same code. And that would be more efficient. Um, to remind myself what the functions did, yeah. Um, like putting frozen food in the freezer. If it's not labeled, it's hard to figure out what it is, right? So you come back in a month or a year, and uh, it is pretty much impossible to figure out what your code is doing, as if uh, unless it um, the functions and all the other parts are properly labeled and explained. Then rewrite. That are not understandable. Um, uh, having to prevent having to rewrite, yeah. So, yeah, that's true. If you don't know what the code is doing, then it is you probably need to just rewrite it later. That happens. Mm -hmm. um, explain the code to myself and others. And people in the research group do not have the same skill level as it. yeah. So essentially, um, either you write a documentation for um, for the people in your research group to use your code, or you end up teaching them probably a few times before they figure uh, before they are confident in how to use your code. So that is a big reason for documentation. Okay, so um, that covers way more than what we had. Um, than what we had in our um, short answer. So that, that last point, shield your limited time, is essentially that yeah, you don't have to keep re-explaining the, um, the same thing to your colleagues and other people. OK. So uh, what is documentation? And um, what would you actually want it to look like? This is um, a pretty much the same question, really. Um, so um, there's a few different types of documentations that are useful. Um, there's tutorials. So these are these show a new user how to do a thing with the code. And it's th these are kind of like the exercises we have in these lessons, for example. Like you have a specific goal and then the tutorial gives you some lines of code to run. It's not necessarily the, code, the, the goal that the user actually has. It's uh, more there to show how to do things. So these are um, these are learning oriented. These are like, um, sometimes they look a lot like lecture materials. Right? Um, then you can have how-to guides, um, goal oriented. Um, 
well, I just said that the tutorials kind of usually have a specific goal, but they um, they are doing a specific thing in order to show you how the code works. Goal oriented here means um, uh, how to guides show you how you should do a specific thing that is probably something you might want to do. So a tutorial is how to train a machine learning model to recognize handwritten digits. You wouldn't probably actually need a code that does that because that's been written a million times. Um, but a how-to guide would be how to train a actual big large language model, how to fine tune it. That's something you might actually be doing in your um, in your real life, like in your work. Explanations, mm -hmm. I, um, yeah, what just essentially telling you what the code is doing and what how the things work. Mm -hmm. um, so that's maybe the most straightforward kind of when you say documentation that might come to mind first. And then there's a reference. So um, something like a list of functions, a list of classes, and uh, what each of those does, why they exist. So there's a lot more here, but this is a, these are the basic parts. If you know what these are and figure out which ones you actually need um, in your project and write those, that is a pretty good place to be at. But um, it all depends on the project. So a small project, just a readme file that contains some a explanation of what the code is and maybe some very short example. That's basically a tutorial and a how-to guide in one. Um, that is probably enough. Um, maybe some in-code documentation that kind of functions as a, as a reference as well. Um, so yeah, in, in a small project, you don't need much. But um, in a bigger project, in a something like NumPy or um, yeah, something big that thousand people, thousands of people use, you probably want all of those and you want to think about them separately. OK, so let's go back to the collaborative document. Um, and let's make a wish list. So um, what would you like to see in documentation when you open, uh, when you go looking at a piece of software, in research software, that um, you might want to use? It sounds like a library that would do the thing you wanted to do. Uh, but you don't know yet. What would you like to see? Oh, maybe I'll copy this to the to the notes. So does it make sense to say that now we are, the question is how do we write and maintain it? Like where do we store the documentation? Um, I guess this is still more about content. Like what would you like to see in, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess someone else's work in this case, that's at least how I think about the question. Mm -hmm. um, Okay. And it, it's talking about research software. So what I have in mind, but this is, so it could be about a big library, but I guess what I have in mind is um, you have a relatively obscure research problem. Yeah. And you, uh, you do some searching and you find a, a Python library or um, some library that sounds like it could do the job. So what would you want that to be in the documentation so that you would actually use that code mm. rather than just write it yourself? Mm. Because quite often you still end up writing it yourself. Um, it could, of course, have you, this could be about a bigger project. It could be about um, something like, um, what would you want to see in Torch documentation or uh, some other really big library, Pandas. <laughs> Do you have any comments? Um, I think I'm talking a lot, but um, yeah, that's just me. No, but <clears throat> here we have like 
very good answers from the yeah. learners. So there are uh, talking about assumptions of the nitty gritty details. And then uh, there is someone saying that one should add a detailed way of the code so that with examples, so examples are often very useful. Uh, so, yeah, dependencies can help when someone is uh, installing the code for the first time. Um, gallery with examples. Yeah, sometimes adding a lot of some images which shows what it does. It's quite useful so that it's not a lot of text. That's true. Uh, what else do we have here? So examples, examples, yeah. Yeah, People there's like... two big things. I, got. I mean, there's like the details of how you use it, inputs and outputs of functions and so on. Mm -hmm. And then there's these under the hood. Um, what does it actually, what are the assumptions? What does it, what is it intended to do? What's the big picture? Those should be, those should be there. Those should be easy to find. And yeah. that's a good point. Where is the code? Um, how do you actually get the live? How do you install it? How do you get it to run? That's a very important part of it, of course. <coughs> and yeah, dependencies kind of goes the same thing. Mm. Yeah. Easy. Easy to find good, points. good structure. Yeah, that's useful. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So we have a lot of points in the answer in the uh, lecture materials um, that are mainly taken from years of answers to this question from uh, the notes. So that's a good read. But I think we. Um, we shouldn't go through all of this. Um, mm -hmm. Mostly, this is repeating what we've said, or something that we will go back uh, that we will go into la later. Um, we will talk about licensing later, but what one important point is including a license file and making sure that people know you can actually use the code. It's not there just for show. Um, oh, actually, that is one of the answers. That is the last answer in the notes. Um, so am I allowed to use it? That's a very good point. Um, so, okay. Should we go to the next section? Yes, we can do that. License. Uh... Oh yeah, there's a next button. Next button at the bottom yes. of the, the page, usually. Yeah. Um, OK, so in code documentation, this is probably the easiest thing to maybe in readme file is equally easy to add, because it's just adding a file. But um, yeah, writing essentially this is writing something into the file that the code is in, writing some comments, uh, doc strings. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. okay. So, um, yeah. So, What is the like the the, the upside? Um, <clears throat> sorry, I was coughing and then I lost my train of thought. Um, mm. So yeah, the the big upside is um, you can when you look at the function, you see the documentation. Like if you're a programmer and you take a look at what there's a function you want to run, um, you can immediately see the documentation. Um, then a um, so it's version controlled 
with the code itself. So you can you you can um, commit it into Git. It will then like follow the code around. It, it's and if the doc string or the comment is in the like in the beginning of the function, it will actually just follow the function around wherever it is in the in the code. So it, you can always find it. But if you're a new user and you see just a bunch of code files, then you know that is not the best starting point. That's the disadvantage, um, which is fixed by readme files. So a readme file is something that's obvious to look at and often automatically opened side by side with the code. So if you look at the code in on GitHub, it will display the readme file directly, for example, and GitLab, I think as well. Um, so yeah, it, readme files are also version controlled in the same way. Um, it's a file, so you have to kind of add it and commit it separately. It doesn't go directly with the code, but it's text. It works the same way. Um, so the, what are the disadvantages? It doesn't, um, essentially the, the opposite of um, in-code documentation. And also it cannot be very complicated or long because it's a single file. It doesn't have structure in the same sense as a website might. Okay. So um, we uh, suggest that you use either or, yeah, uh, well, suggest, I guess, um, that you use either RST rich text, uh, restructured text, or markdown um, to write documentation. So these are mostly automatically rendered by different tools. So um, you can use them. You can use them relatively um, easily. Like you don't have to generate anything to, and you get some nice structure that you, you get a good looking documentation out of it. Some headers and uh, subsections and so on. And of course, uh, you are using, you're currently using Markdown to write in the notes. So you roughly know how it works. Okay. Um, so we don't have to go much into this because we'll come back to it later. In fact, we'll come to we'll back to everything about here. Uh, everything here we'll come back to in a moment. So uh, here's some, so HTML static site generators. That's an, a, another option. Um, so if a readme file is not enough, if you want something bigger, so you, we want multiple pages or um, you want more structure into the documentation. It's a big enough project that you need that. Then um, static, static site generators are a good tool. So they can turn um, this RST uh, or markdown code into um, nice looking websites. So we will demonstrate with Sphinx and um, it can use Markdown or RST. Um, it's, well, we're demonstrating it because we know how to use it, but also it is very uh, general and relatively easy to use. Um, but yeah, there are other options too. And um, so this uh, package down, which is popular in our community, these often are tied to the language for understandable reasons, like it comes with the language or it's written uh, for that language so that it's easy to use uh, in that language. Uh, Sphinx is very general though. Um, it's not limited. It runs on Python, but it's not limited to Python in any way. Um, but yeah, there's uh, lots of good options here that you can check out. Um, also, Zola is what we use to build our project website. So it's another option that we like. Clearly. Okay, so um, at least the popular Git repositories all allow you to directly serve uh, static HTML and actually build um, your HTML sites uh, using Sphinx or something else. Um, so you know you don't have to do um, 
you don't have to have a, a web server to uh, host your documentation pages. But okay, so there's also wikis, uh, which are very similar to a static website. The wikis would exist outside. So um, okay, a static website um, is written in Markdown and restructures text. Um, mm -hmm. It will be in your code base and version control with your code. So that's nice. Uh, and wikis tend to exist separately. But also wikis allow a kind of um, collaborative editing that doesn't require the users to know Git. So it requires them to know wikis. So um, that's a trade-off. But they are also useful. So yeah, the barrier to write and edit is very low. There's um, People often use LaTeX and PDFs. You can also version control that with your code. It later is code. Um, a PDF format though is harder to share and it, it's uh, not something you would probably want to version control with your code. Um, yeah. So at uh, Odoxygen is a way of generating API documentation, which um, we'll demonstrate with Sphinx how to do API documentation if we have time. But mm -hmm. um, so I saw quickly, yeah, there was a point in the notes. So can you use can um, can you use the documentation that's included in your code, uh, the encode documentation, to automatically generate? documentation, um, this sort of API documentation. And that's what Doxygen is for. Um, there is also a tool in Sphinx to do that. So yeah, I mean, one upside with putting uh, using um, in-code documentation is that you can then automatically ex also extract it into uh, a separate website. It's much harder to go the other way around, right? Uh, to go from a website to um, having documentation that kind of links to your code. So this is, um, it, it's a nice way of um, essentially getting both at once. And the good thing is like, it's always up to date with the code. So if you change the function or take it away, the documentation is often uh, kept updated. So it doesn't go yeah. old. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so whenever you change the function, you hopefully also remember to change the documentation because it's right there. Whereas yeah. if the documentation is separate um, in some other um, a markdown file, you might um, forget to do it or you might not do it at the same time. And then it will not be up to date. That's Great. a good point. Yeah. Okay, so... We have a bit more detail in the next section um, mm -hmm. about in-code documentation. Um, so we have already talked a good bit about this and about, um, well, all of the other sections, I think. Let's do the exercise so that everybody gets to chip in. But then I think we'll move relatively quickly. So um, I will add a poll on the notes. And the question is, which one of these um, comments is more useful documentation or is um, which one of these is better and you can also say why so it's info block here and we'll vote for either comment a um, so maybe can you share the notes um, yes. so that I can so I will explain what I'm typing in So we've, um, so like in the polls that we've had before, um, either vote for comment A or comment B um, by adding some character in there. Um, 
at least in the edit view, it will be clear uh, which one has more votes. It's kind of a bar graph. <clears throat> and then um, I'll also add the question why, so that you get a chance to explain yourself if you want to. I think people are pretty clear on this question, but why is the second one better? Hmm. And I guess like, what are the good, um, in what way is the first one good, in what way is the second one good? Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, essentially in the first one, if you know Python or if you know, I mean, it's two lines of code, it's relatively clear. If you know almost any programming language, you can figure out that these two lines are checking if the temperature is below minus 50 and printing an error. So the comment is not giving any new information really, um, unless you are completely new to coding and you don't know what this smaller than sign of this if statement means. Um, in the second one, it tells you why it's checking that the temperature is, uh, if the temperature is smaller than 50. So it is actually providing useful information in that case. It's telling, so if, if you are thinking of changing those two lines of code, um, you know what you're doing if you read that line of comment. So it's actually useful in that sense. Okay. Now in the next part, um, a couple of ways of not use com uh, to not use comments or um, these are something that, um, well, okay, I, I'll just say um, ways to not use comments. So often you'll see um, someone comment out a couple of lines of code. Like you don't need that check anymore. Um, it's for some reason it existed in an old version of the code, but it really shouldn't be done anymore. Um, you can just delete those lines of code and use version control instead. Um, if you need those lines back or you need to see what happened there in a previous version, then you can check out the previous version of the code and um, and actually look at what it was doing. Uh, whereas in this one, if it, it often, ha often happens that then the code around the those commented outlines evolves so much that uncommenting those will just break the code. So it, there's no point in keeping them around in the that ver later version. So yeah, um, comments should not be used instead of version control. Um, another one is emulating commit messages. So you are telling people why you are making a change, um, which could equally well be a comment message. This might actually be slightly more akin to documentation. Like you do, you're telling people what the function is, doing, what the lines of code are doing, but um, you could be more, um, this could be written differently to be better documentation and you could use the comment message to, um, to have your name attached to the change and tell people when you did it and wh uh, why. Okay. But um, I mean, I, I was a bit hesitant of saying that you shouldn't do this because sometimes you might end up making a small change and going back and then you know uh, you do want to actually uncomment the code later, for example. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, using comments to replace version control is uh, usually not a good idea. Okay. Nice. 
then um, there's some examples here of doc strings. Mm -hmm. So how much should we go into this? Because we already talked a good bit about this. Um, let's just leave this to the level of an example then. Mm -hmm. um, so here are how you here, here are examples of how you write doc strings in different languages. Um, so in Python, um, the first one is, oh, and of course, in, in each of these examples, in all of these languages, the first one is a regular comment and it doesn't exactly attach to the function. It's useful to have uh, when you look at the code, but then the second one is a doc string. So that's something that will be kind of a property of the function in a way. So you can extract it from, if you have the function, you can um, use some command to extract this doc string. Um, and you can use this to build and uh, automatically create API documentation. So this is kind of, um, in each of these languages, this is a, um, this is a point about syntax. So how do you write a doc string versus a comment? Okay, Does is, it that, make is that clear? Is that clear? I, I think I'm, to myself, I, think, I don't sound clear. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can also add like, uh, yeah, when it comes to comments, it's mainly meant for the user and the, and the programming language, the compiler or the interpreter usually skips it. And, uh, doc strings are like special comments which has uh, some some sort of standard attached to the programming language so there is one way to write it so it tends to be useful for the user but there might be a tool which can understand it and uh, process it in a way when you're uh, writing in code documentation does yeah. that make sense yeah so, so something like Doxygen or um, or Sphinx mm -hmm. or some other um, automated thing can pick up this um, doc string and build a website that displays all the functions and all of the doc strings for those functions. Mm -hmm. Whereas the the first one, the first example is a comment, and um, well, it doesn't have the same structure. It cannot be used in the same way. True. Sure. So for example, in uh, Julia, you would write a long multi-line comment in Markdown format. And that is understood by the Julia's Markdown library. Uh, whereas let's say in Python, there are certain uh, formats of writing the doc strings. You, and you'll have headings, which for example, say parameters, which refers to the input um, and the returns block, which tells you what the output is. So there are some uh, standards which dictate this. Uh, and when it comes to Fortran and C++, it's it has some things which has, there are some special keywords which are uh, specific to Doxygen, which is widely used for documenting such code, Fortran and C++ codes. Okay. Um, yeah. I've been babbling on and we are a bit behind schedule. Yes. Uh, we should go get to the readme section and then talk a bit about Markdown before we get to Sphinx, maybe after the break. So, mm -hmm. but there is a good question. Um, did you write the doc string entirely yourself? Um, I don't know, of course, who wrote this example, but um, when I write code, I have um, an extension to the, my editor that actually fills in a template almost um, uh, almost entirely. So it takes in the parameters and uh, adds in. So here, for example, in the Python doc string, um, there is the temperature uh, that's defined as a float. Yes. And um, so you could use a, um, you could use a tool to extract that information and write the everything except this actual comment line, uh, the temperature in Fahrenheit. Is this something mm -hmm. you would write yourself? And that yeah, there's so there are tools that 
take care of the syntax. That is true. And and but at the very least, like a single sentence is also a valid doc string. So yeah, sometimes yeah, yeah, true. You don't have right. to list all the parameters. Yeah. The return values. Yeah. Okay, so readme files. Um oh so the yeah, okay. So in the readme files section, we don't really talk much about syntax and we have talked about what you need in documentation. So um this is mostly an exercise hmm. or um, a discussion. So let's quickly think which one of these do we do? We probably don't have time for that. Multiple. Um, uh, there is one. So the first one would be a pure demonstration. Hmm. We have had some discussions. Okay, let's just do the first one because the other ones would require people to dig up their own readme files and then have a discussion in uh, probably in the notes, but with someone. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So this is some more um, some more uh, markdown syntax, essentially something that you can do in uh, readme files in most environments. So let's. Um, do you have a GitHub account logged in where you can easily yeah. create a new repository? Sure. So <laughs> or just a readme file that you um, that you can show with, or uh, make edits. I guess it's probably <laughs> best to create a new repository quickly. That's yeah. best. Uh... So let's say uh, read me demo and let's me and I create one empty read me. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. And then we edit the readme file. So there are a couple of uh, effects in the notes. Uh, so let's take a look. Yeah. So there is a note. Yeah. Which um, highlights some. Uh, it it it's kind of it highlights information. Um, I think not especially strongly. Like uh, I think it's a blue box. Oh, preview probably works for that. Yeah. But yeah, it's a blue box. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then if you do essentially the same but write important instead of note it will be um, a different color slightly more visible and warning i think is then red i think important is maybe yellow oh it's okay mm -hmm. um and then yeah then there's import uh, warning which is yellow uh sorry warning which is red so this is something like this is meant to draw people's attention, of course. <coughs> okay, then yeah. let's try these um, description tags. So this is details and then summary. So details here, these are like, if you know HTML, um, the section goes from the details tag to this end of slash details. <coughs> But it contains a summary section. <laughs> I guess yeah. so. Details. I guess the idea is that you don't necessarily need to read this part. This is like extra details. So, so it will yeah, be. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, so it's it... not showing it by default. Right. And then you click on it, you'll see. Yeah. So it could be like a read more to find yeah. out kind of section. Yes. And then um, there are also batches that you will see in a lot of projects. Mm -hmm. So let's just try one. Um, so the idea here is that a batch is an image you get from some website. They would usually be at the top, mm -hmm. but they show something about the current state of the project. So when the um, 
when the project no actually when you load the page it will check a website and that website will return this image um, so it could for example depend on whether your tests have passed it might passed. show that tests are currently oh. failing, are currently failing. Um, And one can add so, also yeah, hyperlinks can, to the bench. Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, right. So the first one, um, the example I think you copied is with a link. It's with um, the link. Yeah. Yes. So it has in the in parentheses at the end it has a link. Um, that goes to example.org, and you can also do the same without a link. Yes. It looked the same, but then, yeah. Yes. Right. So those are some tricks um, mm -hmm. that you can do. Um, does anybody know any more good tips and tricks on or read me files on different systems or different um, different repository websites? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do one more. At the very bottom of the page, there's the table of contents. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, so you're on GitHub. GitHub actually automatically creates a table of content contents for uh, readme.md files. Yeah, you just need to add some sections. Right. And then it yeah. will um it will have a table of contents. So let's try that. Um uh, let's something like installation and then uh, contribute. Contributing license, yeah, uh, something here. MIT license, let's say. Uh, does it show up here? I don't know if maybe we need to okay. commit this. Um, yeah, I think you need to commit and then, yeah, so the preview doesn't actually generate the table of contents. Right. Uh, wait. And save changes. That's strange. Uh, it's because in the preview. Okay, that was probably your previous commit then, or no? This is a new. Okay, maybe I'll create just a copy, oh. copy everything, <laughs> and go back to the. So that's weird. Yeah, maybe some. Um... Yeah. Okay. Oh, it okay. Was... Did yeah, you did oh. save. Oh, it did save. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, this is the yeah lit right yeah good yep. okay hmm. okay now um we could do the break now and then go on to Sphinx yeah um uh, could you explain why one wants to use batches um <clears throat> so yeah it's um. It's mainly, so if you would want to, for example, show um, on, uh, show, have in your readme just a section that says all the tests currently pass. So it, this version of the program works. Mm. Yeah. So you could do it as um, just something that checks a website or check, yeah, well, it checks a website that returns whether tests have passed or not. Mm -hmm. um, and that's essentially what we're doing here, but what it returns is an image instead of a, a piece of text. Mm -hmm. So when and you again, go to a project, the batches mm -hmm. will tell you that this version that's currently in this master branch, um, that should work, for example. Um, it, can it can also have other information like uh, yeah, the digital object identifier. So. I can click, uh, it's a link to a, um, well, Zenodo, for example, a link to some place that actually um, stores the object identifier. Or um, So that um, DOI is for, uh, essentially for citing your code, uh, citing your work. Another um, thing yeah. is, uh to show the most stable, latest version of the code, which is uploaded in some index, like 
PyPI, for example, uh, so that you know which is the current version. And because often the code on the GitHub would be a development version. So we are going to static site generators, I think, after the break. Yeah. Um, but since the section title is writing good readme files, um, maybe we can go back uh, just mentally for a moment um, in mm -hmm. your mind, go back to the beginning of this hour. And um, we talked about what we would want to see in good documentation. So the wish list. Um, so essentially, if all you have is a readme file and encode documentation, then a good readme file is short, um, but it includes all of those sections. It includes a summary of what the code is, like a top level headline um, summary at the very top of the readme file. This project is for X, and then it has steps of how to use it um how to reproduce some so a tutorial this is how you install it this is how you run it to reproduce the results in my paper or um, if um if it's research software then probably you know, reproduce my paper is the first thing um or a simpler example but something that gets people running the code and shows them how to use it and then um some more detailed description of uh, of how the how the whole thing works, um, however much detail you want to have there, and the rest would be in, in code documentation. I think that would be a good readme file. Um, I mean, of course, all of this uh, giving the information visually makes it quick, makes it nicer, makes it quicker. Um, but as long as the information is there, that's the most important thing. Um, do you have anything to add before we go on a break? No, that sounds good. Okay. So after the break, we'll come back to um, static site generators and um, ex uh, especially Sphinx. So we will essentially uh, be writing um, writing a an example documentation website using Sphinx. So let's see after the break. Um, let's do well ten minutes, but it's fifty-seven. So let's just do eleven ten. Is that that makes sense? Mm -hmm. So yeah, see you back at eleven ten, or um, whatever your time zone is, um, ten past the hour. Bye. Bye. Okay, hello, welcome back. Um, so now we're going to static site generators and specifically a Sphinx example. Um, whoops, I did not scroll back up. Okay, Sphinx and Markdown. Uh, so you can, in the how to document your research software, you can find this in the sidebar. And Okay, so let's go. Uh, so yeah, so the idea of this is mainly a demonstration. Um, it will be a relatively long demonstration. Um, and the idea is to understand what these static site generators are, what they do, and um, know how to build a documentation website with these text files that you can then, um, that you can then version control. And uh, along the way, we'll create an example of Swing documentation using Markdown. Um, so I'm going to assume that you're just watching, essentially, the demonstration. Um, but you can also try it yourself. And um, I mean, if you if it's hard to keep up, then I would maybe recommend uh, watching first. Um, of course, the, the video is also available later, but the notes and the questions are available now. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, so before we start, um, I will actually move 
this nodes window out of the way to show a terminal window. Actually resize it a little bit. Whoop, there we go. And there's some unnecessary test here that I was doing previously. So let's get rid of that. Okay. Get rid of that as well. Okay. So um, the first thing we do um, is Conda activate code refinery. This is the environment you may have installed uh, following the installation instructions for week two. Okay. So now we have the code refinery environment active. We'll check the Python version. This is essentially checking we have Python. Uh, 3.12 is the latest version. And then let's check that we have Sphinx build. Whoops, build, okay. And check the version. So we have Sphinx build. And the so the uh, the notes, uh, the lecture materials have uh, relatively older versions, but I think everything should work. Uh, we'll figure it out as we go if something fails. So there should also be a Sphinx quick start. And yes, it exists. Okay. Finally, uh, we are going to use mist parser. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm running some Python code that I write in the terminal, that's Python minus C. And then I'm going to import mist, oh, mist parser. So this checks that the library is there. Um, if you import something and it doesn't print anything like it didn't, uh, then the library is there. Okay. So we have everything we need for the demonstration. Now I'm in an empty folder. Um, it's my code refinery folder. So I'll create a new folder called doc example, documentation example, and go into it and then run Sphinx quick start. And it will ask me a bunch of questions. So the first thing, do I want separate source and build directories within the root path? I will say no. Um, so it's asking for a project name. Um, let's just call it test. I'm not being, I'm not feeling creative right now. Um, <laughs> author's name. That's my name. Um, project release. So which version? Uh, of the project is this, and this is 0 0.1, this is the first one. And project language, let's, let's keep English as the default option. Okay. Now it has created a bunch of files. Let's see. There is a underscore build directory. Um, underscore often in Python means that you ignore it, you don't print it and um, well, you ignore it in a lot of contexts. So it's something that Python will often not look at. Um, same goes for templates and static. Sorry. Okay. So um, I think the most important ones at first are index. This is the main page of your website. It's in the rich tech app. Uh, I keep mixing that up. It's it's in the uh, restructured text format, RST. So we'll see a little bit of that, but mainly we'll be working with Markdown. Um, then there is this conf.py that includes the configuration for the documentation website uh, and for the building process. Build is where the actual website will go when you build it. Static contains files that like images, static files um, that you don't build every time and um, that are essentially served with the website. I mean, if you have done web development, then this is very familiar, but it, images go there mostly, some other files. Templates, um, you might want to create your own templates for these HTML files, but we probably will not go to that here. Okay. Make file is the instructions to actually build the website, um, which we, you can essentially just invoke um, or make .bat for Windows. Okay, so the main things though that we will be looking at are index.rst and conf.py. Okay, so let's take a look at index.rst first. 
Um, just a second, okay. So uh, what do we see here? Do you see the whole page? This D, yeah. does it cut away? Okay, good. Um, it's cut away a little bit, but not by much. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So, um, yeah. So this contains a table of contents or a, defines a table of contents. And then it defines some indices and tables that are a default there. Um, we will not use the indices and tables section. So let's remove that one. Um, then these top four lines here, starting with two dots, that's a comment. Uh, Sphinx, uh, oh, sorry, rich restructured text has this interesting syntax where dot dot means uh, a command, but then if you don't have a, if it doesn't start with, or doesn't have this uh, format of a comment with these double colons at the end, um, then it's a comment. So this is a comment. Um, and then this section is a title. And this is a, a special uh, restructured text comment that generates the document, uh, generates a table of contents. OK. So one, change, one more change that we will make is add a, uh, add a section to the table of contents called someFeature.md. So this is a file name, and we don't currently have this file. We'll need to create it in a moment. Um, it, need, it needs to be on the same level as this caption section. OK, it seems to be. OK, let's save this and go back to the command line. And um, in order to use Markdown, we will need to use, use this missed parser that we checked that it exists. So let's go to conf.py and make sure that we're using that. Um, this has essentially the information that we added uh, in the um, in the author generation when it was asking questions. And here we have extensions. So missed parser is an extension that allows us to use markdown files. So we will add it here. OK. So here we use missed parser. And I think that's the only change we need to make to the uh, configuration. So let's go back. Um, and then we can create this uh, some feature.md. And add some contents to it. So the title. Um, this will also be the title in the table of contents. So it will actually get it from the file itself and not just the file name. Or the title will not just be the file name. There can be subsections. Um, So we document some useful and exciting functionality. Let's make a list. <coughs> you do need the empty line here for the list to work. Item one, you can have nested items in lists. But then you do need the, you do need the, I don't think you need an empty line here, but the example has some. So just to make sure, I will add it. So if you are um, currently typing in the notes or looking at the notes, that is also using Markdown. It has exactly the same syntax. Or this one is using this missed parser. There's many flavors of Markdown. It has some special syntax for some special things, but mostly it has the same syntax. Okay, so now I exited the file and saved it. And 
now we can uh, build the site. So first let's check what files we have, just what we had before, nothing in the folders, in the build folder. Um, then let's do Sphinx build dot and uh, so dot is the current folder and that contains this index.rst and con.py and we will place the results in the underscore build folder. Okay, and again, let's look at actually. Nope. Okay, so um, I was thinking I could make a um, list of all the like a, a tree structure of what is in each of the subfolders, but it's only lists of all the names. So let's look directly at the build folder. We have some new files in the build folder. Um, mainly index.html and then some a, some feature.html. Um, these are the pages we wrote. And then there's some um, useful extra features um, that are included in this page. So, okay, let's then go ahead and open this. Um, it will it should open in this web browser when I type in the code. So let's see. Um, so when I type in the command, so xdg open, and let's go to build and find uh, index.html. Okay, let's open that. And here is the whole website. So it includes the sum feature in the table of contents. And then it actually lists the subsection as well. And if you click through here, you will get, you will see what we wrote. It has the list and uh, the main text. So um, it's all there. Um, you can, uh, so it has used a default option for, um, for what it looks like uh, for the theme of the website, but there's multiple themes to choose from. And, uh, some extensions that add additional themes. You can also build your own if you want to. Um, although, of course, that's more work. Okay, so let's go back and continue. Um, okay, so actually we have finished the first section of the exercise. Um, and we have one page in the documentation. So um, any comments, questions so far, let's uh, give some time for that. And decide where we go next. Um, is there a specific document generator that's used for PyPy? I think PyPy just takes the readme file. Oh, actually, you need to tell it where the readme file is. Um, and then it renders it on the main page. So um, mostly you can add a link to your documentation, whichever way you generate it. So why do you want the Sphinx page rather than just a readme file? That's a good question. Um, mainly because then you can have multiple pages. So if I show this again. Um, so I could have a second feature here and each of these have, has their own page. Um, I only have one, one feature or one uh, sub page here, but you can have a whole, um, a whole collection of pages explaining different parts of the, um, of the software. So it's, um, if you want, uh, so just a readme file is often enough, but if the readme file is way too long and it's hard to find the information you want, um, then 
then you should uh, th then you can use something to build a a uh, more extensive documentation with multiple pages that's easier to read and it's easier to find the stuff you're looking for it does also have a search feature mm -hmm. so if i search here for feature go um i find the some feature page i don't really have a lot of pages here so um it's found the same page twice essentially Someone also added that things can also do API reference. So that's a good point. It's the yeah. in code documentation part, which we talked about previously, using doc strings to generate documentation. Yes. So um, we have some, there's a section here with some more essentially markdown syntax and uh, missed specific syntax. Um, we could experiment with that, or we could actually do the auto documentation section next. That might be because people have talked about it. Maybe we should do that. And then we do the, well, then we go to a different section. Um, but let's, let's do that next. That seems like people are interested in it. Okay. Because unfortunately, we don't have time to go through everything. But if you want to, you can uh, you can do this uh, Sphinx, adding more Sphinx content um, section to uh, learn more about missed syntax and markdown syntax. So it's adding, you can show this again just for a moment. So in addition to lists and different levels of headings and so on, uh, well, you can add images, um, links to websites, and code blocks. So this is, of course, very useful when you're documenting code. OK. <clears throat> so but now I will um, go through this Sphinx auto documentation section. So in order to generate auto documentation, the first thing we need is some Python code or some code. Um, that has uh, in code documentation. So let's create that first. And I'll just create it directly in this folder, which is usually not quite what you would have. Um, you would usually have a separate documentation folder and a separate code folder. But let's keep it simple for now. So we will call this multiply.py and it will contain a single function called multiply. It takes in A, which is a float, and a B, which is also a float, and it returns a float. Okay, mm -hmm. so this will add a doc string. First, let's do the implementation, which it will multiply these two functions. So A return A times B. OK, and then the doc string. So this will be extensive for this function, but this is an example. So I want a an extensive doc string that will um, that documents all the parameters and so on. OK, so we multiply two numbers. That tells you exactly what the function does. Um, we have a parameter a which is the first number to multiply. We have another parameter B. Multiply, okay. And then it returns, so return um, the product of A and B. OK, that's probably enough. So I save it and exit. And then um, I will need to add a new file called api.md, a markdown file. That will actually, this will be the main page of the API reference. <coughs> <clears throat> so let's give it the title, API reference. Then. It will contain, oh, this is, um, 
yeah so the module in the um in the uh, demonstration um was called example but i called it multiply this doesn't matter this is just the title of the um of the section but i want it to be correct oh so so make it lowercase because it is the name of a module and the name of the module is lowercase okay right then we actually um we add a command that will create this um, auto documentation so three ticks like that to start a um, a command section in this mist flavored markdown um, and we'll call it uh, eval R oh, i mean the command is evaluate rst uh, restructured text the reason for this is that um, there is an auto module um, feature or an auto module uh, extension to Sphinx, an auto documentation extension um, that will actually generate this um, API documentation, uh, but um, it needs to be invoked in restructured text. That's uh, as far as I know, there's still no way of directly invoking it from Markdown. So let's write um, restructure text here. Auto module. And the name of the module was multiply. Okay, so now it's looking for a Python module called multiply. And then I will tell it to document all the members of this function or of this module. Okay. Is it called multiply with a Y? Oh, uh, yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. So that would have caused an error. Okay, yeah. and I guess I'll fix that one as well. Okay, yes, it is called multiply with a Y here. Okay, then we will need to add something to the configuration to conf.py. So we now have this missed parser extension here. We will also add Sphinx, it's spelled correctly, yes, dot ext extensions dot autodoc. So this is um, included in Sphinx, but it is not automatically um, included in the project. So you need to um, need to um, add it to the configuration here. Another thing we'll need to do um, is a trick to get it to look into this uh, current directory because we added the module in the current directory. So we will add it to the Python path. Um, I guess we need to import. import OS and system, and then add it to path, insert. So this gets the current path and then adds it to where Python looks for modules. Okay. Finally, we'll go to index.rst, and uh, we have some feature that markdown here, here in the table of contents. We will add this api.md, the API documentation. Okay. And so that's all. Now um, I need to run Sphinx build current folder, and um, the results go to the build folder. Okay. And the changes should be visible here. So I need to reload the page probably. Oh, I need to go to the main page. Okay. Hmm. What went wrong? Any ideas? I think we're showing the search feature, but we can try to open it again. Oh, I was looking at the search page. Yeah. All right. Yes. Okay. So this is the main page. Sorry. So. Yeah, no, so now it has the API reference section, and that section contains this uh, multiply module. So let's go there. This um, shows the multiply module, and um, the multiply module contains a multiply function, and it has a, a, a much more nicely structured uh, view of this, um, of the text that I wrote, these parameters and return value. Okay. 
and you can from this link you can go directly to the multiple module although i think we are there already oh no sorry this copies a link that um highlights this section okay yes okay so now we did sorry uh, there is also a comment on the notes that someone yes. pointed out that there, there is a miss markdown equivalent of writing the same okay thing. so maybe yeah maybe they are yeah maybe nice. let's test that so in the um, api dot markdown instead of evaluating rst here we can do So this is a section called auto module. And then we have multiply here and members. Okay, let's see. I don't think should be intent, uh, intent. Sorry, but should not be members, intended. Yeah, and then there was, uh, yeah, that looks good. We can try that. Okay, let's reload the page. Yeah, seems to work. Okay, good. Okay, that was actually good to know. Uh, I guess we'll update the uh, update the website with that. Uh, now let's go to a related but somewhat different topic. Um, so GitHub pages and how to. Let's go to the next section. So how to get your documentation easily visible to everyone um, so that they don't have to get your code and use things to build it and then look at the website, but rather that they can just go to a, a single website and take a look at the documentation. Okay, so um, we've been using GitHub for a few things so far, so we'll use GitHub. Yeah, but you can also, of course, do this, basically the same thing or very similar things on almost all of these, uh, at least all of these pop popular uh, repository websites. Um, okay, so let's just go into it so that we have about 10 minutes to do this. That should be enough. Oh, um, I'm sorry, I'm not quite showing the whole I want to also show where I'm going to the GitHub website. Okay. Um, so there is this documentation example project template, which I'm opening here. And uh, this will create essentially a copy of this documentation template web uh, repository, but it will be my repository. I will call it doc example. Okay and make it public and that's all. So let's see what's included here. Okay, so here we have, um, we have a license, a readme file. We have some example Python code. Oh, actually we don't, we just have a readme file on this page as well. Um, here could be some source code for your project. And then we have um, in the documentation, we have some feature, another feature, and uh, the configuration file. So we have everything we need to build the documentation locally, but we want to actually do it automatically on this GitHub page. Okay. Um, just a second, because I haven't actually opened this on the side. Okay, now I have. So um, then, so the next step is, okay, browse to this repository and I showed you what the contents are. So now to get this to happen automatically, we need to do a couple of things. First is we need a recipe or essentially a program that um, GitHub follows to build the, uh, the Sphinx website. And that's a uh, that's called an action on GitHub. So we'll create a new file, and it needs to be in .github slash 
workflows and then we can give it whatever name so documentation dot what it needs to be a yaml file yml <coughs> Okay, and then I will mainly just copy the um, the workflow file from our um, uh, uh, from the lecture notes to um, to this file. So there are a couple of things that I will uh, look at and possibly change, but mostly um, this is just copy paste. Um, so I essentially would never write this on my own. I would just copy it from somewhere. Um, so the name, obviously you want uh, whatever the workflow name is, um, you might want to change that. This will run every time you push to the repository, every time there's a new pull request, and also it can be, um, you can decide manually to rerun it. Um, and then, well, there's some like system. It runs on Ubuntu. It does some. It checks out your repository, um, installs Python, installs dependencies, and here we see a uh, missed parser. And we actually have a theme that we're using, read the docs theme, which is nice. It's a nice looking theme, and um, of course, Sphinx. And then we run the build command. And then there's an information on how to actually deploy it, how to um, how to get GitHub to actually display it on the GitHub pages. Okay, so we'll save this file, commit changes. Okay. Um, so now i wonder if the workflow is actually running so i had this actions here yes so we made a new commit so it should run it is running okay and you can get some more details from here so it is following a, a set of steps here it's actually done now and okay let's do it in this order so what it has done is it has created a new branch called GitHub pages or GH pages. And that just contains the website. So um, everything needed for the website is there and it will automatically update whenever you push to the repository. One more important thing, we need to actually turn GitHub pages on. So I went from here to settings and then to pages, deploy from a branch, and then we select GitHub pages here and say, Okay, and now it should work. I think it has somewhere here, it usually tells you what the URL to your website is. Um, it is always the same, so I know it off the top of my head, but of course you might not remember. Oh, well, um, I usually also add it here. So there is this about section and it is actually, um, it is your username dot github dot io, not com, but io, and then the repository name, doc example. Okay, so it is always the same structure. Oh, so, okay. Use your GitHub Pages website is is an option here, so you can it it can automatically fill in the uh, the URL. Okay, so slightly changed interface, but it is still at least at least as convenient as before. Okay, so now I have the link here, and I don't have to remember um, what exactly it is. Okay, uh, and it displays, so this is not exactly what we wrote locally because I copied it from the template. If we had done exercise um, two instead of exercise four, then it would look like this. So it has um, the documentation, it has a nice, nice sidebar here um, because we're using the, um, 
the read to docs theme instead of the default theme. And then it has the actual contents of the page here. So this is what we wrote in the example. Um, and well, yeah, so now it is online for everyone to see. And this works as long as your repository is public. If you have a private repository, then um, I guess you probably wouldn't want it to be displayed here anyway, uh, the documentation. But um, then it, uh, I don't think it's a free feature. But in any case, as long as it's public, this works. Um, and yeah, you can do the same thing on GitLab. The steps are different. The interface is different, but the uh, the principle is the same. I think we have a list here of alternatives. GitLab CI and GitLab Pages. Read the Docs is a commonly used um, hosting alternative. Um, so this is separate from these repository websites. So it will need to have access to your repository. You need to be able to clone it, and then it will build the documentation for you. Um, so yeah, and you can of course build them manually or create your own workflow to build them and uh, host them anywhere. Sorry. Okay. So here's some steps for migrating to Sphinx if you already have some documentation to migrate. Um, I think we should go um, to the wrap up section, to the summary. I agree. But, yeah, let's take a look at the notes quickly. Oh, There's some questions that were there? answered, I think. Okay. Uh, but there are a couple of yeah. them. Does Sphinx work with GitLab? Of course it does. So you can do the same approach. Yeah. So there GitLab is CI. Um, yeah. GitHub CI is essentially the same as GitHub Actions and GitLab Pages is the same as GitHub Pages essentially. Mm -hmm. So you can do essentially the same thing. Uh, and then there is this question, how do you connect or link the Sphinx documentation in your repo to your repo on GitHub. So I think there is a Sphinx setting somewhere in the conf.py. I can't collect it from the top of my head, but it specifies where the uh, repository is or where you actually intend to publish. So then when you render it, it links to the source. But this is very specific to the theme. Uh, am I right? Yeah, no. Um, yeah, so there is a, there is a setting. Um, if you look at the config file, config.py, I think there's a setting for the URL somewhere in here. Oh, I guess not. I guess you have to add it. Okay. Well, then um, I don't know off the top of my head how to do it exactly. Um, I wonder if that is what the question was about, though. I guess the um, it's this edit button which comes up. Yeah. Sometimes. So one thing I did just show uh, here is um, so in so in one direction it's um, straightforward. So it's straightforward to add the link from the GitHub to these GitHub pages. Going the other way is less straightforward, but you can of course manually add, um, oh, this is the documentation. So you can manually add on the main page, um, a link to your code. Oh, but now there is a view page source. Seems to know where it is. I wonder actually where it got the information. <laughs> but uh, you can I think, back. yeah, Sphinx actually saves a copy of the... Oh, okay. So okay, that's why right. it comes okay. so in the generated version. So it's actually okay, there. but that's a bit of um. But there is actually a, a that's way. A, yeah, so I mean you can always add it as text here. That rep the repository is at an URL, so that's a, always a solution, <laughs> although not automated. Um, okay. Um, let's go to wrap up. Oh, hosting websites. So 
I mean, yeah, I just I, I did show you this uh, very quickly. There is um, there's a branch called GitHub Pages where it actually pushes the new version, uh, or the most recent version of the documentation. So you can uh, also use GitHub Pages to just directly write HTML and uh, host it there. So um, if you're using GitHub anyway, this is a straightforward way of hosting a website. Um, same goes for GitLab and all the other old alternatives. Um, but probably not spend more time on that, unfortunately, because we don't have that much and we want to go for lunch in time. So uh, yeah, just the general wrap up for documentation. And yeah, I guess the most important takeaway is you, well, you should have documentation for yourself and for others in your team and for other users outside your team. But there is no one right way to do it. Like for a small enough project, a readme file is enough. You probably want some in-code documentation. For a bigger project, in, in the in-code documentation should be really especially if it's meant to be used by users. If you're talking about a function that's meant to be used by actual users, then it should be really well documented. And you should also have some sort of um, static website, at least for the documentation. But the, then there's everything in between, right? And it's very, like, it's really up to you to decide where you go from one option to another. If that readme feels too long, then it probably is too long. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's no one right way to do it. So, um, any final thoughts? Yeah, and then there's always progressively different ways to improve it. Like adding more user-friendly sections and yeah yeah. <coughs> yeah of course whatever decision you take you're not stuck with it um you can you can always at least add more um so you can add a static website and copy stuff from the readme to the website mm -hmm. um and have a nicer structure with the table of contents um, but, well, the README does have a table of contents, so you can create one. Um, but the so the main thing is that the README shows all of it at once, and you have to like, scroll or hyperlink to different sections of it. Um, on a static website, you can split it into multiple pages, and it it should be easier to read in that sense. Yeah. Another consideration is like, uh, ask yourself who you are targeting this. And uh, is it someone who is new to the code or is someone who is already into the code and needs to know the nitty gritty details? So you, you should have something for both. And it can even be a future maintainer who should know how to publish the code and keep it updated. Yeah. Yeah, I guess like to me, that's kind of the minimum. If you want to be the code to be usable or maintainable in the future, then you should have at least enough documentation for the future maintainer, which is likely like, it might be you. Um, but still, you will not remember. So that's kind of the minimum. Um, but then like, if it's really a big library and you want it to be user-friendly, then you should have a lot more than that. Is anyone rethinking how they're doing documentation right now? Is anyone um, not doing documentation, but is thinking of how to do it? You could add your thoughts in the final summary section in the notes. Yeah. Very welcome to do that. Okay. Uh, well, there's um, there is a good amount of recap, of, of course, in the um, on the page that I'm showing. 
Um, so there's, we uh, talked about readmes and static websites. We talked about um, in code documentation and how um, API documentation, how those two work together. And of course, there's uh, several options. <coughs> we didn't really talk about how to write tutorials, but um, that's also a very good addition if um, if if you have um, slightly bigger program or just um, examples of how to run the code. Um, So yeah, that is the general summary of the documentation section. So um, next we'll talk about Jupyter, but before that, let's have a lunch break. So um, we will see you in one hour on the hour. And uh, yeah, um, have a good break, um, find something to eat and yeah, see you. Bye. Bye.